and introduce Natalie Minacci from Fairbanks. We'll be talking about ocean acidification. Next week we have Russ Hopkopf, um, maybe also from Fairbanks, who is going to be talking about oceanography and plankton in Pacific Town. So, welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Um, I work at the Ocean Acidification Research Center, and this is a, a lab group at um, University of Alaska Fairbanks. We're part of the School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the university, and uh, we're trying to understand ocean acidification uh, all around Alaska, so in the Gulf, in the Bering, and in the Arctic. And we do some various different kinds of field work and, and tools and so forth to measure that. So I'm going to go into just a little bit to the background of ocean acidification, if you're not familiar with it, and then kind of talk about some of the some of the projects and tools that we have ongoing for that. Um, so has everyone heard of ocean acidification before, probably? So this might be a little bit of a review for you. Um, it's the reduction in pH. And um, just as a reminder, you know, we have the pH scale, um, neutral is 7, uh, acidic is less than 7, so juice, coffee, tea, all of that is Acidic, and then you have uh, bases are above seven, soap, bleach, that sort of thing, or are all above that. Does anyone know what the pH of seawater is? Eight. So that's a base. So I think that's like one common misconception some people have when we talk about ocean acidification. You know, we're not really saying that. You know, the seawater is acidic. We're saying it's becoming acidified. So it's it's all relative. So 20 years ago, the average global pH of the surface ocean was 8.2. Today, the average global um, pH of the surface ocean is about 8.1. So that is decreasing, and we're saying that is the acidification, it's a decrease in pH. Um, and so if you hear any buzzwords on the, the radio or something about people saying the ocean is turning to acid, you know, be aware of what you're listening to and, and realize that the term acidification is really relative to what it was in the past and, and now it is, that pH is decreasing. Um, so ocean acidification is primarily caused by the uptake of increased, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we've all heard of this increased CO2 emissions from anthropogenic sources and um, as that concentration in the atmosphere um, changes, the ocean is uptaking all of this excess CO2. So that's the primary cause of ocean acidification. So you may have seen some um, graphs like this before. This is just the last four years. And even in the last four years, you can see that the global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations were in the 390s, and now we're over 400. And so as this, um, as this increases, that's going to change the interaction with the atmosphere oceanic boundary layer. <clears throat> so there's a whole team of atmospheric scientists and climatologists and lots of people that study carbon dioxide in the ocean, uh, excuse me, in the atmosphere. So we can go to some of these sites and say, you know, what is the average carbon dioxide concentration, um, you know, this year compared to a few years ago? And you can look these up on the NOAA sites. But we're really interested in uh, looking at the. It's on the right. Oh. Oops. Can we turn the lights on for a second? Oh, yeah, here it is. Sorry. Yeah, so we're really looking at this ocean atmosphere exchange here. So we're looking at um, the, the exchange of carbon dioxide from the ocean, from the atmosphere, excuse me, into the ocean. So there's the global carbon cycle, which has a lot of components to it. And it's going to be affected by anthropogenic sources. It's going to be affected by natural sources, such as runoff and uh, circulation in the deep ocean, you know, soil changes, all these sorts of things. But the primary driver of this carbon cycle that I'm looking at is this exchange of ocean atmospheric um, carbon dioxide. So the field of studying ocean acidification is relatively new. 
you know, this is, this is still a greater global carbon cycle question that we as chemical oceanographers have. You know, so everyone in our field pretty much started out as a carbon chemist. And now we're looking at this and saying, you know, what specific parts of that carbon cycle are we looking at and were we trying to understand with respect to oceanography? Um, so it's this gas exchange that you might remember back, you know, to um, high school chemistry or something. If you have an area of uh, high concentrations of a, of a gas, it's naturally going to want to come into equilibrium. The, the natural environment likes to be in balance. And so if you ever have an area of high concentration and then you open a valve, like if you say you're, you know, living in this little class world, if you open this valve, the gas is naturally going to want to become in equilibrium with this vacuum. And so you're going to have an equal distribution of concentration of this gas. And that's the exact same thing that's happening at the surface of the ocean. And so if you have a gas, which in this case is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, interacting at this, you know, which is basically the surface layer of the ocean is this valve. And, you, and so you have this interaction. If you have a higher concentration in the atmosphere that it's, want to, it's going to naturally want to go into the ocean. So that's when people talk about the ocean is absorbing all of this excess carbon that we have. Um, the same is true in the other direction. This is, this is a two-way street here. If the concentration of carbon dioxide is greater in the ocean, it's going to leave the ocean and go into the atmosphere. So when we're talking about the carbon cycle, we talk about the ocean as either a sink of carbon, which is carbon from the atmosphere going into the ocean, or carbon as a source to the atmosphere. So that's carbon dioxide leaving the surface waters and going into the atmosphere. So this is what I just explained written out in chemistry. So, um, so we have the, the carbon dioxide entering the water when you combine carbon dioxide with water, you form carbonic acid. And so notice again, all of these arrows are two-way two arrows. So everything wants to be in equilibrium, everything wants to be in balance. So if you, if you load this side of the equation, you're increasing carbon dioxide concentrations, you're going to create more free hydrogen ions. And that's how we're measuring pH. pH is the concentration of these hydrogen ions. So as carbon dioxide goes up, in the water, our pH is going to go down. So that's that's basically what ocean acidification is. I'm going to get it right one of these times. Okay, so we've seen these um, models for predictions of atmospheric scientists develop these models to say what are the various scenarios what will happen if we, you know, continue as normal if we curb our CO2 emissions if we decrease our CO2 emissions. So knowing uh, what we understand about that equation that I just showed you we can project that onto the pH. So if we're looking at um, this model, we're here now, and then there can be a drop in pH if we decrease our carbon dioxide emissions, or there can be a much greater pH change if we continue business as usual. Um, so the third point I wanna make about ocean acidification is that the, the global carbon cycle is a really big thing. It's, it's, it, it's interacting with land, it's in, interactions in the ocean, interaction with humans, so on and so forth. There's a lot going on. So there are changes with, with regards to ocean acidification outside of this increased carbon dioxide that are both natural and human induced. So um, a natural change is gonna be biological processes. You know, things growing in the ocean that are either uptaking CO2 or giving off CO2. So uptaking would be photosynthesis and giving off CO2 would be respiration. And human activity could be anything like increased river runoff with high nutrient loads or something like that, which is all gonna change this, this balance and it's gonna shift the um, equilibrium in one direction or the other. So why is this interesting? So I've talked about this atmospheric carbon dioxide coming into the ocean and forming um, 
and forming carbonic acid, which is decreasing pH. And so there's a lot of organisms, as I'm sure you all know, and are very familiar with, probably more familiar than, with, than I am, there's a lot of things in the ocean that are um, using calcium carbonate to either build their shells or their skeletons or so forth, or there's organisms that are feeding on these plankton. So if these uh, organisms are having a hard time either building their shells or living or reproducing in their biological cycle is, is disturbed, then that's going to cause a problem um, perhaps through the food chain. It can, it can move up trophic levels. So here's uh, a picture of some pteropods. Pteropods are the primary food of, I think, pink salmon, right? So um, this is a pteropod at zero days. Um, what would, they did is they took some of these models, sort of like I just showed you, they're projecting these pH levels in the ocean in 50 years, 100 years. And then they make up, replica, uh, replicate that um, in an incubation you know, experiment in the lab, and then they're growing these pteropods in the lab. And what they're seeing in these conditions is very fragile, brittle shells. So you guys might have seen something like this um, in the newspaper, and if they're, if they're having a hard time building their shells, there's going to be many other biological responses that are going to be affected by this down the road. So some of those biological responses could be changes in respiration or metabolism. Um, if they have these fragile shells, they're requiring a lot of energy to maintain that shell. So, so even if you say, okay, I have this calcium carbonate organism that has this um, shell, and it's, and it's very hard to maintain that shell, um, they might still have a shell that's perfectly fine, but all of their energy is going in that to make sure that they have you know, a suitable home or suitable you know, defenses against predators or, or whatever they're using these, these calcium carbonate appendages or whatever for, they're not putting that energy into reproduction and growth. So that's a big problem, because even if the organism can survive those conditions, they don't have offspring, then it's, it's still not a good scenario. Um, and it can also affect changes in stress tolerance. So we know that there are organisms out there that have already been exposed to these you know, acidified waters, these, these deep waters that have um, acidic conditions. So the change in the stress tolerance is saying, maybe this organism lives in the Bering Sea, and there's a pulse of this deep water that has these, um, low, these highly corrosive waters that comes up onto the shelf for maybe six weeks a year, or three months a year, or something. And that organism can tolerate that for that short period of time, but they can't tolerate it for six months. They can't tolerate it for a year. Maybe they can only tolerate it as an adult. So if you have a juvenile or an adolescent um, in different areas of their growth, straight, sta growth stages, um, they're going to handle that stress tolerance differently. So this is really where, in my opinion, ocean acidification research is going. So I'm a chemical oceanographer. I'm going out there and I'm taking the samples and I'm measuring the numbers and I'm producing numbers and values based on what I'm seeing. I'm not applying that to, um, to biology. I'm not applying that up the food chain. I'm definitely not applying that to economics or policy decisions. So that's really the next big step that, that the researchers have to make is is understanding this link between various um, levels of, of corrosive waters, where they are around Alaska, how long are they there for, um, and then what does that do to these, to these organisms. So this is a kind of a global summary that if you go to some um, you know, ocean acidification websites, they usually say, um, you know, where is ocean acidification the most, um, the biggest threat? Where on the globe do, the, do you have to be most worried about seeing corrosive waters? And so they tell you that it's regions where you have naturally upwelling, cold, low pH, deep water. So that's Alaska. And the oceans near the poles where you have lower temperatures, 
because lower temperature water can hold more gas in it. That's Alaska. And coastal regions that receive freshwater discharge. We have an enormous amount of freshwater discharge in the coast surrounding Alaska. So we, we hit the nail on the head with all three there. So that's why it's very important to understand um, the, the carbonate cycle around this state in particular and around the Arctic in general as well. So that's kind of our main mission. Our main mission is to understand the intensity, which is the number. Is the number a two or is the number a one? Um, the duration, you know, are we seeing a number two all year or are we seeing, you know, a number two for part of the year and a number one for another year? And then the extent. So, so where around Alaska are we seeing that? And we do that in a couple of different ways. We do shipboard surveys where we go out on research vessels and we do CTD profiles and look at the water column and chemistry. And that's what all these black dots are, are stations that we've um, been to around Alaska, which is, I think, approaching 1,500, which is, which is pretty cool considering how big Alaska is that we've been able to cover this much real estate um, in, in about eight years. And then we also have these yellow dots, which are our moorings, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. So when we go out and we collect water samples on our shipboard surveys, I bring them back to the lab and I run them on our benchtop instrumentation. And I'm analyzing, uh, car I'm analyzing the dissolved inorganic carbon, the DIC, and I'm analyzing total alkalinity. So the cool thing about these, four, these top four parameters is that if you measure any two of them, you can calculate the other two. So you don't have to measure all of them. Uh, but you do, do need to know the concentration of all of these parameters to be able to say something about saturation states. And so saturation states is what we're using to apply to the biology. So we say this is the state where it is either difficult, impossible, hard, whatever, um, for marine organisms to take that carbonate out of the water and to use it. So turning that, you know, into, into something use, usable for an organism. So I'm just going to focus on the Gulf for now. And, you know, I said that thing about uh, areas with great freshwater input are, are more susceptible to ocean acidification. So the Alaska coastal current, as we all know, um, you know oops, sorry. you know, transports a huge amount of fresh water starting from these black bars are showing precipitation, you know, starting from down here in Seattle all the way up to Unimac Pass. And so it's collecting all this fresh water along the way. And so we really wanted to be able to take a look at that. And we were very, very lucky that we had an ocean acidification specific cruise last July that left Seattle and ended in Kodiak. And this is the first time that we've had an ocean acidification dedicated cruise. You know, normally when we send these research ships out, it's for a you know, total ecosystem study. You know, it's really expensive to send these ships out there. You're trying to do as much as possible. So if you're out on the ship for a month, you know, you might have 10% or 20% or something um, of that cruise dedicated to your project or to your research. So to have an entire research project on, on a research vessel uh, dedicated to just monitoring ocean acidification across the entire Gulf um, was, was really special. And a lot of these transects have been maintained uh, by other groups in the past. And so we're, we already know something about a lot of these transects. And when we do these near shore stations, um, and then move offshore, we're really able to see the transport of that fresh water that's either coming out of Crop Strait or off the Copper River or out of Cook Inlet. So this is very preliminary. Um, you know, that cruise was just last summer, but once we finish working up all the samples and start analyzing the data, we're really going to be able to hone in on, you know, some of these hot spots. We have these, you know, warm, fresh waters, obviously, you know, in your area, 
and, and in other areas along the coastal current as well. And so once we get a better understanding of the changes in that fresh water, we'll be able to understand something about the total goal. So globally, um, if you go to a, a global just basic information about ocean acidification site, they're going to tell you that oops, the increase of carbon dioxide is decreasing pH globally. And that is very true globally. So you're averaging all the regions, all the different ecosystems, and you know, equators, poles, everything. And that this um, total alkalinity is remaining static. And that's very true. So, so carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing on a decadal scale now due to anthropogenic carbon dioxide sources. Um, and so that, that input of this carbon dioxide into the ocean is changing on a decadal scale. And we can see that and measure that. Alkalinity is a geological scale. And so if you look at all the different ions and species that are in the seawater, that's really a, um, a result of weathering that's happened. So you're, you're putting in all these different um, ions into the water, which is, which is what we're calling total alkalinity. So they're saying that's not changing globally, which is true, but locally, that they're all changing. They're all going up and down. It's not a, this is going up, this is going down, this is staying the same. So what our job is to do is to go into all these different areas and say, what is changing where and what is its intensity? So the fresh water um, that I talked about is really going to change that alkalinity. So if you have a huge pulse of glacial meltwater that has a completely different composition of salt water, that alkalinity is going to change. You're going to change everything else in that equation that I first showed you know, at the beginning of the presentation. So you don't have this simple carbon dioxide goes up, pH goes down kind of equation anymore. So we were able to do eight stations in the Copper River Plume this summer, which was really cool because nobody had ever taken um, any measurements or any samples for ocean acidification. And we were out, I think, maybe 100 kilometers offshore, and then we just drove right up the plume. And so, so once we get that data, I think it's really going to tell us a lot about, you know, how, how that system is affecting downstream and how that's being changed. Um, in the Alaska coastal current. Uh, so another project that we maintain is the Seward Line project. Have, has anyone heard of this project before? Um, Russ Hopcroft is a faculty member up at UAF. He'll really be giving a lot of specifics about this next week, which is convenient for me. So, so you've heard about it before. So one of the main components of the Seward Line cruise is the um, is a transect that goes offshore of Seward that they've maintained for a few decades. But we're also um, maintaining stations in Prince William Sound. And so all the purple dots are these stations that we're maintaining. Um, and we visit them in May and September of every year. And so once we get enough years together, we'll be able to say something about the changes of, um, of the water coming into the sound, how the chemistry is changing based on the circulation, of, of course, which is highly impacted by all the glacial melt and then coming out and hitting um, the shelf again and joining the Alaska Coastal Park. Um, so back to the yellow dots, these are our mooring locations. Um, we have four currently. We used to have one up here off Barrow. We had uh, we had this one for about five years. It's out of it's been out of the water for the last two years, um, and we're hoping to put that back in this summer. Uh, but our, our main mooring locations are, are down here. We have three in the Gulf and one in the Bering Sea. Uh, so these are what the moorings look like. These are um, our surface, surface buoys. And so the only one that we have that's seasonal is this one in the Bering Sea. Uh, there's sea ice at this location on the 70 meter line. And so we have to take that out every winter when the sea ice comes in. All these other ones are out year-round. They have a satellite link, so they upload it 
it's data once a day. So every morning I can come into the office and, and get the data uplink and, and look at how uh, all the instruments are running the previous day. Yeah. I think that one's name is Peggy. Yeah. Do they all have names like that or? No, just Peggy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Peggy before? No, that's my nickname. Oh, really? <laughs> you should Peggy. come out with us. We're deploying it in a month. <laughs> I'd love to come out with you. <laughs> so, the, so the Oscar Dyson is the NOAA ship. Are you guys familiar with the Oscar Dyson? And so, um, you know, everybody that fishes in that area, you know, you know, knows Oscar and, or, and knew Peggy and everybody. And um, this site was trawled every year. So we lost all of our equipment. It's probably trawled maybe every three years now. But they kept hooking on to our mooring lines. And so we said, well, if we name it after Peggy, <laughs> maybe they'll leave it alone, and they did. <laughs> and so everybody was like, oh, everybody respects Peggy Dyson. Like, nobody's going to touch Peggy's buoy. And so we stopped losing equipment every year <laughs> because people weren't hooking up to it anymore. Uh, we haven't had any problems like that on these sites, but maybe we should give them all nicknames, too. <laughs> I know that this site um, in Port Conclusion, has anyone fished in that area? There's a bunch of um, fishermen that tie up to this one and my uh, office phone number is on it. So whenever they tie up to it, they call me and they're like, hey, we're at your buoy. I'm like, okay, is it broken? And they're like, no, what is it for? You know, just whatever. <laughs> so I get a lot, of, a lot of phone calls from that one. And then these two, I don't think I've ever gotten a phone call about, about these two. But this one is definitely a good place, I guess, to anchor up for the night, just tie up to the buoy. Uh, so this is the mooring diagram. We have a, um, about a 10,000 pound um, anchor. We have several um, uh, train wheels stacked up that we weld together. And then we enclose that in a big concrete dome. Again, a lot for, um, you know, if people do run over that area with lines or nets or whatever, um, the, the concrete dome can kind of slide that off sometimes, where a big, a big stack of train wheels will get caught up in people's equipment and we'll, we'll lose the moorings. So this is our mooring outside of Seward, and we put this one out in 2011, and we now have um, four complete years of data and we're just starting our fifth year. We turned this site around two weeks ago, uh, so we're now getting uh, new data from all of our fresh sensors on it. So this is a temperature plot. We have time down here on the x-axis, so these are year days. So day one is January 1st and day 365 is December 31st. And then we have temperature uh, in Celsius here on the y-axis. And so it's what we would expect. We see our temperature minimums in the winter and our temperature maximums in the summer. And here's salinity. We have, um, which is pretty much the inverse of temperature again, which is what we expect. This isn't very far um, from Bear Glacier outside Seward, so we, we definitely see a really big freshwater pulse in the summer, which is causing this decrease in salinity. And so here's the um, carbon dioxide. So, so at these buoys, we have an instrument inside that's measuring the carbon dioxide concentrations in the water right at the surface and in the atmosphere right at the um, surface of the buoy. And so in green, we have the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. It's around 400, which is what we would, would expect. And then these are the seawater um, concentrations. So this is um, kind of a classic spring bloom look at carbon dioxide. So we have equilibrium of carbon dioxide in the seawater um, through about five, five or six months of the year where we have concentrations in the seawater and in the atmosphere that are near equal. Um, so that's maintaining that gas diffusion equilibrium that I talked about before. Um, but then in the spring, you have the spring bloom, you have this burst of phytoplankton growth you know, plants are, are consuming carbon dioxide like crazy, and so you have this really quick drop of carbon dioxide um, in the seawater, and then it gradually comes back up to equilibrium in the fall where you have 
greater wind forcing that's turning that water over and, and mixing that with the atmosphere. Um, so that's just showing you the power of plankton. So plankton is changing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the seawater over 200 microatmospheres. That is huge. You know, that's a really, really big change at this site. So if I took a ship to this site on January 15th and took a water sample and brought that back to Fairbanks and analyzed that and said, the carbon dioxide concentration at this site is exactly the same as the atmosphere, then that is a very, very big difference from what's happening in June. So if I took a ship out in June and collected a water sample and I say that the concentration of carbon dioxide is 200 microatmospheres lower than the atmosphere, then I'm going to say something totally different about the processes and what's happening at that site. So that's, that gets back to our, our three questions, our intensity, which is the number, um, the duration, which is, is this happening for a week? Is this happening for six months? Do we see these numbers all year round? So, you know, moorings are, are, you know, a real key to being able to answer that duration. We definitely don't have enough money to send a ship out to this site all the time and to, and to observe that. So this is our buoy in southeast. So this is in Ch the south end of Chatham Strait. And so I just talked about how this, this again is you know, time, and then we have the carbon dioxide concentrations here. We have atmospheric levels that are the same, what we would expect, around 400. And in the summer, we have this drawdown of carbon dioxide concentrations in the seawater due to the spring bloom. But the rest of the year, we have these really high numbers, up to 600 here, up to 700. You know, so your atmospheric concentration is 400, and you're seeing concentrations in the seawater way above that. So we're going to go back to the um, gas law here and say, you know, over six months of the year, this, the, this site in southeast is a source of carbon. So we have carbon dioxide in the seawater going into the atmosphere, and it's only these short summer months where you'll have carbon dioxide going into the ocean. You know, so, so understanding um, the intensity, the duration, and then the extent, saying where is this happening? Is it, is it the same everywhere? Well, this clearly shows that this site in Southeast is completely different biological processes that's happening here than outside Seward. You know, so if you're going back to these total carbon scales, and you're saying, you know, what are my numbers? What is my carbon budget? And then once the biologists tell us what's happening to these organisms based on these numbers, we can say, well, the organisms in this region might have a completely different ecosystem now that they're living in, you know, in this area versus, you know, sewer. And then, and then planning, you know, maybe fisheries policy or economics or whatever around that in the future. So, to sum that up, it's complicated. You have all this other stuff going on, which I'm definitely not going to describe. But, uh, and I don't even understand half of it. But this is just to show you that every site is not the same, even when you're just in the Gulf of Alaska, which is completely different from the Bering Sea, which is completely different um, from the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas. But they're all connected. You have this Alaska coastal current picking up these different signals and carrying it into the Bering which is then, of course, carrying up to the Arctic. So there's still a lot, to, a lot of places to go to understand all these mechanisms. You know, and this is pulling in that whole ecosystem. You know, I can talk about the, you know, the carbon cycle forever, which I don't think everybody will really want to listen to that forever. But you know, you have to add that into the biological processes, um, and then you have to, you know, interact that with the human ecosystem as well. And so ocean acidification uh, research is, is still developing science. And as we learn more about just the basics, the fundamentals of the chemistry around the state, then we'll start to be able to incorporate that into, into the human ecosystem. Um, so this is my favorite picture. Did you guys go through the, any of the pictures when Obama visited? <laughs> this is my favorite. Um, because 
this was, you know, I think it was the Kenai Fjords National Park Tour. And so he's doing this big thing about national parks and this big thing about Alaska and needing to be resilient and adapt to climate change and so on and so forth. And so he did a Kenai Fjords National Park Tour. Um, and this is and this is Bear Glacier. And uh, and this is Bear Glacier. And this is where Amorian is. So it was right <laughs> it was right there. So it was just it was exciting for everybody um, to see that you know this is this is an area that that is definitely important. Um, and we're still learning a lot about it, um, but but there's there's still more to do. So that's it. Thank you. I guess we hear a lot about methane and kind of how it's warming. You know, it's a quicker warming agent. Now, yeah. I guess something like my chemistry, but uh, yep. how is that uh, chemically interacting, do you think? Um, I'm not sure about how it's changing um, the interaction with the surface ocean boundary. Um, I know that there's definitely methane inputs, especially all along the oceans, and they're definitely finding more and more in the bearing. I haven't heard too many people researching um, methane plumes in the Gulf. Maybe, maybe you know about them. but. Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna that's that's gonna change the carbon cycle, but it's definitely gonna be one of those local effects. You know, so methane is carbon, um, and so as that interacts with the carbon cycle in that localized area, yeah, it could have a, it could have an impact on that specific e ecosystem. Uh, there was a um, an idea a few years ago when they started finding all these new methane. Um, Plumes along the Aleutian, they're going to take some of these sensors that we have, um, pH sensors, and, and put them all along there to see if there was a huge change, um, you know, and maybe put another one 10 meters away and another one 30 meters away, but it didn't get funded, so I have no idea. <laughs> Do you have um, an idea of the, the, the dramatic difference between Seward and Southeast? Um, do you have any idea of what the actual specifics are that caused that? It, it I don't, and and I'm my first guess would be it's a respiration signal that there's that the the flushing at that site might not be as um, extreme as you see at the one in Seward. So the one in so all of these locations are in except for in the Bering Sea are in a semi you know enclosed location. Um, and that is on purpose because we lost one in a 60-foot wave, and it and it picked up all the anchor in the chain. You know, so you have you have your anchor, and then as your fail safe, you usually have another 10 or 20 meters of that chain where the wings are like this big, and that's if for some reason the um, connection to the anchor fails. You still have that enormous weight of that chain dragging along, and it picked all of it up and just walked it right out. And then it landed in a spot that was a lot deeper, <laughs> so that was really bad. So then we had to move everything into these sort of semi-enclosed areas. And so there's a possibility that the flushing and that um, port conclusion is not as good as you have in the end of Resurrection Bay. It's really exposed to the swells there. You have the swells coming into that bay um, pretty good. In Port Conclusion, you don't. So I'm guessing that there, you know, as um, the tide changes up Chatham Strait, you know, you can see that line across Port Conclusion. So I'm not really sure how much that, that water is getting cycled out. So then you're not necessarily getting that southeast oceanic signal. Now you're getting a port conclusion signal. And the one in Seward, you're definitely getting this northern Gulf of Alaska signal because, you know, in, in Kodiak as well, it's really um, a lot more um, flush to that in those areas. Yeah, so I think you, we really have to study so many other processes in that area to know maybe what the, what the, we were absolutely sure what the driver was. Um, but for now, for us to say, you know, it's a source, it's not always a carbon sink, 
is enough to understand, you know, how you might want to interpret that into some of your models down down the road for future predictions. So I'm I'm curious how you transport your samples to Fairbanks without. I mean, are they airtight containers or? Or yeah, they're glass sample bottles, um, and then we wrap the threads in Teflon, and we have a conical cap, and so when you screw the cap down, there's a conical, you know, space that, that eliminates some headspace in the sample uh -huh. bottle, so you don't have a, a big plug of air in there, yeah. so you're not putting all this extra um, carbon dioxide in there. And when um, my boss started measuring, he originally did work in Bermuda. And they have a very long time series in Bermuda, and they were, you know, measuring um, ocean acidification there. And it's a lot different here. When I bring my sample into the lab, you know, there's a 20 degree temperature difference, right. and they all crack and explode. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a real like art to being able to leave <coughs> just enough headspace in there to allow the volume of that water to expand when it warms up. Because I have to measure these all at constant temperature in a water bath in the lab. Um, but not too much, because <laughs> I don't want to add that um, atmospheric carbon uh, signal in that bottle, yeah. But we definitely have a lot of breakages, because they are glass bottles. So I tell people, especially from communities, we had some um, community scientists in the Prince William Sound area, too, that were sending us samples, and then I run them for some of the schools around the state and everything, too, and then, you know, it's, it's like, if this is just for fun, then you can take one, but if you really need the answer out of this bottle, you better take two or three, because <laughs> it might break on its way to Fairbanks. Yeah. So what do you take initially? What measurements? I mean, just, you grab a sample, mm -hmm. I mean, so you obviously take the temperature at that time. We have to have temperature and salinity to be able to do all the other calculations. Yeah, and then and then usually in the systems that we have, we also have oxygen concentrations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you uh, <clears throat> spoke about the pteropods, the sea snails, and that, those were laboratory experiments, mm -hmm. right? So um, this might be a question for Russ Hopcroft, maybe, yeah. but I'm just wondering if there's been any field collections of, the, of these pteropods where yeah. they've noted Right. That they have fragile shells. Is that? Yeah, and that's a hard thing to do. Russ can definitely elaborate on that. Okay. What we found out, so we brought on a researcher a few years ago that was going to go through the archive of Russ's archive wow. for the sewer line and all Prince William Sound and go through and look for changes right. through the last you know, 15, 20 years. Right. Okay. Um, but the um, they dissolve in the ah. So. There's none left. Right. So, so in the recent past, it might have been the last three years or so, um, we now take a subsample out of Russ's net collections right. on every single station and preserve that in ethanol, which doesn't dissolve the shells. So now we just need someone to go in and and do do yeah. that analysis okay. and uh, um, and and look at the shell strength. Right. And UAF just hired a new faculty member that's specializing in the biological effects of ocean acidification. And so I'm not sure if she's going to be working on um, all these old samples that Russ has, has collected over the years, um, or if she's going to be doing more um, live growth experiments. Um, and the growth experiments, you know, there's Bob Foy's doing the crab experiments in Kodiak. And then Tom Hurst is working on fin fish in Oregon. Um, but then all the other pteropod work mostly has been done outside of the state. Yeah. So I think that's definitely an area where, if anyone knows somebody who wants to get into this research, it's definitely an area where there's samples available and, and somebody could look at that. Yeah, it's a big question, especially, yeah, you mentioned pink salmon, it's just a really important food item for them. Right, yeah. yeah. So if that, if that changes... And Russ better. might have the latest developments on if there's somebody up and coming to look at that. Right. Uh, we just started another project that we're collaborating with Russ on. We did an um, ocean acidification survey in Glacier Bay with the Park Service there for about three years. I think it was 2012 to 2015. We had a master's student on that project <coughs> did... Um, a cruise eight times a year in Glacier Bay, and we 
sampled um, the main bay and then both the west and the east arms. Mm -hmm. So we really started to look at um, just the basic numbers of, of what the chemistry looks like in the bay, how it changes over the seasons, all that stuff I just talked about forever. And now Russ has a graduate student that's looking at the plankton. So that's kind of the you know evolution of this research now. So so the most important thing to everybody is how is this going to affect the greater ecosystem? Um, and and there, those are definitely different steps in this process and completely different sciences at this stage um, that people are still figuring out. When you're taking these, doing these stations, at what depths are you sound them? Uh, it depends on where we are. So the sewer line on the shelf, um, I think the, I think the shelf really starts to drop after about 500 meters, um, and then we go down to 4,000 meters at the at the deepest station. And so we're really getting a, a near shore shallow environment, and then to the deep deep environment. Um, and then when we do our profiles, we sample the upper water column. Um, very fine, and so every five or ten meters until about a hundred meters, and then after a hundred, we space it out, um, and so the water is much more um, uniform and stratified. What the deeper you get, and so a sample at three hundred meters typically isn't very different from a sample at four hundred meters, um, and we have a real time feed out on the ship, so we can see those profiles, so we can see the temperature and salinity change. Just about everything else changes right along with temperature and salinity. Um, so if you have a big change in temperature and salinity, that might be, you know, an eddy coming, spinning off the Alaska Coastal Current or something like that. Um, and then in the Bering Sea, I mean, m most of the shelf is not over 70 meters. So, you know, we could go out on a cruise for a month and never take a sample deeper than 70 meters we're working on the Bering Sea shelf. So it really depends on just where you are. So how long does the 4,000 meter Too long. take? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is like, oh, is it going to be on my ship? So we're usually on 12-hour shifts. We have 24-hour operations. And I think the last cruise we went on, this big Gulf of Alaska um, cruise that I showed, where we went from Seattle to Kodiak, we did several off-the-shelf deep casts to get that, that end member. And I think every single one of them was on my shift. <laughs> I was like, ah! Um, it takes a few hours. So which ship is that? Um, that cruise was on the Ronald Brown. It's a NOAA ship. And so NOAA is making a dedication to all the regions now. And so they're funding ocean acidification, um, you know, federally for like the global research in all the different areas. And so they'll do an East Coast cruise, and then they'll do a West Coast cruise cruise and then they'll fund a Alaska specific cruise and so they funded that cruise in 2015 so we won't come up for that again until 2018 to do an Alaska specific um, OA cruise from, from NOAA. Uh, but we go out on all shapes, sizes, uh, the Healy 400 feet to the Moon Trapper which is 14 feet, you know it just, <laughs> just depends. So there was a, the University of Oregon, or Oregon State has an oceanographic ship. Mm -hmm. When I saw it here, when you, is that one you used to? I haven't been on that one. Um, the UAF just got one. They got the Sekuliak. Have yeah. you heard of that one? Did they come to Cordova? When it came up? It didn't. Okay. You, you might see that eventually. Yeah, so we had a, we had a ship, um, I can't remember when it was, when he was retired, but um, I came up about 12 years ago, and I think it retired just about then. And now we have our own vessel. But the thing about these vessels, especially if they're a world class, so world class is, you know, they can cross the oceans, um, and not just regional specific. So they're big enough, and they have the water-making capabilities of fuel storage, whatever. This is a world-class ship, which is really great, um, but that also means that it can go anywhere. So if we don't have enough Alaska-specific funded projects here, it's going to go anywhere. You know, so now it's the Sekuliak, the new icebreaker for the University of Alaska Fairbanks, primary projects are in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know. So, so it just depends on what ship is where at the time. And then um, because they're so expensive to run and maintain, they'll tag team the regions. You know, so if that universe, uh, Oregon State ship came up here, chances are the next cruise was kind of going back the same way. So they're not gonna they're not gonna haul back empty. They're, yeah, they're always they picked gonna, up some stuff in the day. Yeah. No, I mean in the Prince Sound. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so they're always they're always running full. So with, with scientists. So have you looked at coral or you've seen the last bit of I have not. And I think that um, I think that's an area that will be really interesting to study in another five years. So um, the sensors are not ready for it yet. So the sensors that we're deploying so if you're looking at coral reefs, you don't want to, it's just for the reasons like I explained before, you don't want to just go out and take that one number on a Tuesday because you don't really know how that affects the whole, you know, relates to the ecosystem as a whole. So you want to put these, these sensors out. You want to leave them in that environment next to a coral or next to a methane seep or whatever for a long period of time, a few months or a year or something. And the sensors that we have to do that are just not very robust yet. They're, they're still in the development stage. So kind of the evolution on these sensors is, on these oceanographic sensors, the physical oceanographers really kind of kicked it off, measuring temperature and salinity and all these other things. And they're bomb-proof. They've been doing it for decades. They have really, really, really good sensors at all kinds of depths and at all kinds of temperatures. And they're measuring an electrical current to measure salinity measure temperature, to measure some of these other um, variables. And now that we're kind of delving into the sensor-based chemistry applications, you know, in, in history we've always taken a sample and brought it back to the lab and done all of our, you know, analysis in the lab. And now the chemists are trying to get to that sensor point to be able to say we're going to deploy this in the ocean, it's going to measure blah, blah, blah. But the sensors are still trying to do chemistry inside of their housing, which is really difficult to do at, at cold depths, at cold temperatures and great depths with pressure and you know, moving parts and all that sort of thing. So there's, there's still a lot of error and a lot of failure with these sensors. So the engineering needs to catch up, I think, before we get some really good, really good data out of those in Alaska. In Hawaii, they work great, you know, at 10 feet at, you know, 75 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and here they don't. <laughs> I mean, this, this afternoon after I left the science center, I was on the phone with an engineer from Ohio for an hour and a half. Uh, we just did that deployment in, outside of Seward a couple weeks ago that I told you about. And um, so inside this one cylinder, it's about this high. It's cylinder, um, and inside of it is all the guts and the working parts, and it's all these valves that are opening different, um, like gas tubing and cha chambers and everything to, to make these gas measurements. And they changed some step in the manufacturing at the factory that makes the valves that they buy and assemble in the sensor, and they don't open when it's below you know, 45 degrees. So, that's a big problem. <laughs> so we had this problem in 2011. So, and we knew that going into it. They've never, de they've never deployed these at cold temperatures or high latitudes before. And it was a real experiment. And that's how we were funded for that initial project. They said, you know, can you take an off-the-shelf pro product and deploy it in Alaska and have it work? And the answer was no. You need to change, you know, all of these different things to make it stand up to our environment up here. Um, and and then we figured out that these valves were too cold. They were like, you know, they couldn't smoothly open and close. So then we changed the program to give a bigger power pulse um, to them to really snap them open and snap them close really hard. You know, and that took 
you know, a year of tinkering around in the lab and figuring that out and recoding and whatever came to about opening. Um, and then we got that fixed. We had four years of beautiful, glorious data. We stick this thing in the ocean three weeks ago. None of the valves will open. And they found out that there was some guy at one of the plants who started putting in different valves. And they never cold tested them before. And then it didn't work. <laughs> so now I have my um, mooring technician back in Fairbanks. I, he, I was like, take them all out of the lab. He's got them all running out on the sidewalk in front of our building in the cold, <laughs> see which ones will work. <laughs> So we have a deployment in the Bering Sea next month. And the Bering Sea is like, you have a one-shot deal there. It's not like you get your buddy in Seward to let you on his boat and you go out there and you change the stuff around. You know, the ship drives by once and you have four hours to put it in the water. If it doesn't work, you wave by and you drive away. Um, so it's definitely an evolving process, measuring chemistry at sea in the water and not in the lab. It's still very much in the lobby process. <laughs> You're talking about the deep ocean water and how it's uh, really uh, has a lot of alkalinity to it, uh, it's corrosive. Um, mm -hmm. as, are we having an effect on the deep ocean water at this point? Uh, has, um, has it become more acidic? It, and, is, it has been, um, so it's naturally acidic. Uh -huh. All deep ocean water is, has, is naturally more acidic than the surface waters. Um, is that because there's respiration and not photosynthesis? Is that totally. what it boils down to? You know, to and you're it? having that detritus thing happening, and then you're just, you're just increasing the carbon along that you know, global conveyor belt. So it's sinking in the North Atlantic, you know, it's coming around the base of Africa, picking up a lot of carbon along Antarctica, coming up to the North Pacific, and then that's where it's upwelling, you know, in the Northern Pacific. And so you have hundreds of years of accumulation of that, of that carbon along there. Um, so there are people that have been able to trace the anthropogenic um, contribution to the deep water and I'm not really familiar with a lot of that research they can see it um, but I think at this point the major um, the major research is really looking at that atmospheric sink is really looking at that that increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going into those surface waters and then exposing all of the upper upper water column organisms or whatever to that. And there, there's definitely an effect when that's exported out of the surface um, into the deep ocean. And the deep ocean has more car 25 times more carbon in it than any source on land. It's a huge, huge part of the global carbon budget. And, and I'm not really familiar with a lot of that work, but I know that there's some people researching it that are tracking it um, from where that is sinking in the North Atlantic and seeing that come up around California. Um, and it's going to factor in there somewhere. Um, so there's water down there that's like pre-Industrial Revolution? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can track that usually with um, um, isotopes from like bomb testing. So they'll be able to say, you know, before World War II, um, you know, there's a ton of radioactive bomb testing. It released all of these um, isotopes into the air, which everything everything makes it into the ocean, right? <laughs> everything drains to the ocean, so that's now in the ocean, and it's being, you know, it's if it's being cycled and downwelled into the deep ocean, and it's moving along that global conveyor belt, then you can go out and find it, and you can say. You know, this body of water has radioactive material in it that was released to the atmosphere, you know, in 1941. And now it's here at 3,700 meters off of, you know, Newport, Oregon, you know, or something. And so then they can calculate the transport of that. And that's how they understand, you know, moving water masses. So, you, so that's, that's um, carbon isotope work. So people can definitely, you know, see that. And there's a big, um, a big difference in the isotopic signature of the anthropogenic carbon 
that we're releasing into the atmosphere from fossil fuels, um, there's a big difference between that and new carbon, newly formed carbon from a, you know, crocus that's outside coming up right now, you know, or something like that. So, so there's, and that's a whole nother part of the, you know, part of the game that people are looking at. Wow, thanks so much, Nelly. This is great. Thank you.